Yeah, so I'll be doing uh, latent variable models. Um, so uh, previously we covered autoregressive models and flows. So the difference between latent variable models and autoregressive models and flows are that in autoregressive models and flows, um, all the random variables are observed. Um, like, so you see uh, x, x1, uh, x2 is dependent on x1 and x3 is dependent on x2 and x, x1 and x2. So x1 and x2, is, uh, all, all variables here are observed. But in latent variable models, um, some of the random variables are hidden. So uh, in this case, it's uh, z. So z is the latent variables that we do not get to observe. Uh, yeah. So why do we want um, latent variable models? Um, it's because uh, simpler, lower dimensional representations of the data are possible. So um, for example, in this image um, of uh, a high dimensional image, um, we can simplify into smaller dimensions, say, Object one is a corgi uh, red and white at x y coordinate. Um, uh, floppy left ear, um, and and it's like a uh, background is a bench in a park. So, latent variable models uh, can automatically identify those hidden representations. Um, yeah. So why do you use latent variable models? Um, Autoregressive models are slow to sample because all the pixels are dependent on each other. Um, uh, we can make part of the observation space independent condition on some latent variables. So, um, for example, for autoregressive uh, models, uh, we usually need to uh, specify the uh, uh, which uh, variables are dependent on which variables. So, um, uh, latent variable models can do the do it automatically. So for example, previously, uh, uh, let's say we have a pixel. Uh, if we have a pixel over here, it, it's, it depends on all, all the previous uh, pixels above uh, and on the same row, right? Uh, but for latent variable models, it can, um, it can uh, automatically uh, find uh, these three objects, for example. And then, uh, so, so this uh, representation, these statistical uh, patterns are automatically captured by the latent variable model. Yeah, so uh, as a result, uh, latent variable models can have faster sampling. Yeah. So uh, sometimes it's possible to design a latent variable model with an understanding of the causal process that generates the data. Uh, however, um, we don't know what the latent variables are and how they interact with observations. So, uh, like for example, um, uh, images, uh, they, there may be objects in different places, but um, uh, sometimes it's, it's not explicitly uh, shown like this. So we cannot really uh, uh, pre-specify uh, the statistical patterns in, of the objects in the image. So, um, so most uh, latent variable models uh, don't assume what the latent variables are. Uh, and the way to specify these latent variables is, is, is still uh, open research. Yeah, so uh, let's use a simple latent variable model. So um, Z is the latent variable uh, uh, sampled from P of Z. So this is a uh, Bernoulli distribution. This is the uh, parameterized by B. Yeah, so X is the data. Uh, oh, so, so Z, we have um, K, uh, K dimensions. Uh, yeah, so for X, um, for X is sampled from uh, P of X given Z. So uh, what we do is uh, when we have the latent variable Z, we pass it through a function approximator and um, from this, we get the parameters that uh, uh, the parameters of the Bernoulli distribution, so that when we sample, so that we can uh, generate x uh, back from the Bernoulli distribution. Um, so, um, yeah, so we first get z, uh, and then um, when we pass it through the function approximator. Uh, uh, we will get um, uh, 
uh, say, uh, a, a, let's say L is three, oops. change this way. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't use this one. Um, I see this side. Oh. That's the one you do? Yeah, this is the one way. This is the chart. Back to the rotation. Yeah, so um so this will give us the parameters for the Bernoulli distribution. And then um from there we can then sample uh from uh from P of X given Z. So yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, if you uh, one more zero. So this is from uh, the movie. Uh, yes. Oh. I'm sorry, I don't quite get the question. Ah, yes, I'm just wondering what value uh, that x, each x uh, can get. Uh, x is the data that um uh, we sam uh, that we want to sample from the distribution. Yeah. It's not, it's not following up the movie. Um, it does not have to be the it it I, I don't think it's, it has to be Bernoulli la, so it's it's just um uh in, in this case uh, distribution used in this example. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I'll see for uh so out of DNA is a parameter which is uh better, right? It's part of uh I'm just asking the uh, What's the use of the deep neural network? Oh, um, uh, so those are the parameters for the Bernoulli distribution. So here, it's a, it should be beta, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so it means, uh, so in this case, uh, DNN out of the, like, K beta, right? Because in this example, like, there are like k numbers of beta are used in here. Um, I mean, on the first line, yeah. there is yeah. k, k beta, and variables, right? Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the parameters uh, that can be trained is the, this beta variable and the, the deep neural network, the function I like, approximate. Uh, so, so now that we have a model with the parameters, uh, how, how do we train the latent variable model? So we use maximum likelihood. So um, uh, log P of X. So uh, the key point to take note of here is that um, it's a sum of uh, all possible values of Z. So um, in this case, uh, Okay, say, say we have k equals 32, so it's a, it's a bit string of uh, length 32. Um, so it's uh, 2 to the power of 32 possible um, uh, bit strings. So as a result, there is a sum of over 4 billion terms. So this is uh, computationally intractable. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a problem um, to, to calculate uh, uh, this. This part, so we need to um, do something to to mediate that. Yeah. yeah. So for um. So we, we can have O one access to P of Z and uh, P of X and a uh, given Z, and we want to efficiently compute P of X, but P of uh. So, so uh, assume we have um, we, we can get p of z given x. Uh, what's the what's the z that generates this x? Um, so x is the one that is uh, computationally in, intractable, right? Um, 
So yeah, we, 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 can, we can get this, we can get this, um, uh, but how do we get this is the, is the, is the question. So, um, yeah. How do you get U of Z given X? Uh, P of Z and X given Z. Yeah. Um, let me try. <laughs> so the P of Z is, is, is given from here. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so this part is the in intractable part. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, so we are interested in finding the, the, uh, Foster distribution of the latent variables. Um, yeah, so how, how do we get by this uh, computationally intractable part of the uh, P, of, P of Z given X? So the idea is that we want to um, approximate the true posterior um, uh, with uh, a variable distribution. So uh, P of Z. So um so uh, what I want to do is uh, we can approximate it by using uh, Q of Z, and um, so uh, we have an optimization problem that uh, we want to minimize the distance between uh, these two distribution, the approximation and the true posterior. So um, for example, we can use um, KL divergence to show the difference between uh, these two, the approximate and the true posterior. So, um, so let, let Q, uh, QZ be the approximation. So we pick a divergence, we use KL divergence in this case. So this is, so Q of Z, P of uh, Z given X, this is the expansion of the KL divergence. So uh, this part, the, it can be expressed can be expressed as uh, the join over the um, marginal of x. So yeah, and then we, uh, when we expand this out, we can we can we can express it this one in this this tree. So when we expand it out to this tree, right, we find that um, the parts that depend on z, the latent variables, is uh, does not include the, the log p of x. So log p of x is the one that, log p of x is the one that is, that, that is hard to compute, right? So, um, and then we are able to compute um, p of z, uh, p x of z, uh, given z, uh, and, and, and these are our approximation uh, in O1 time. So, uh, so in this case, um, what we can do is uh, so 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 this this part right that, that depends on z is is called the variational lower bound, and um, right. So so when we minimize uh, via uh, the the KL divergence, uh, we can our approximation of the true posterior improves. So you want you want to minimize uh, KL divergence. So this is the KL divergence. So uh, what we find is that uh, we can shift the terms around this, this term and the variation of lower bound uh, around. So uh, what happens here is that um, uh, the KL divergence is, is um, positive, right? Uh, the, it must be, it's, it's not negative. So um, as a result, log p of x is always greater than the variational lower bound. Um, so that means that if we maximize the variational lower bound, uh, we can get close to log p of x. Uh, 
and as the, at the same time, uh, the KL divergence will will decrease. Yeah, um, I'm not too sure about the the bound the, the tightness of, of this um, uh, as well. <laughs> Um, so what, what does it mean when uh, we say that the optimal cure of Z or VLB is basically this line? What does it mean VLB is tight? Sorry? I can also. Yeah, so actually, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm presenting until here. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so when the Q X is not ID one, right? It will be equal to the P Z So the KL divergence will be zero. Right? So it will be like the log uh the log P X the value will be equal to the log which will be equal to the lower log. Also like when it's close to log P of X. When when the QX is not optimal one, which is the one that you want, the KL divergence will be zero, right? Hmm. Basically, when q equals to p, your KL divergence is zero. So your second term in, in this equation disappears, and you just have the log x log of p of x is equal to parity of the log. Yeah. So that's it. So when it's equal to the log, then there's only one value to take, which is the log. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think the first thing I do here is to uh, try to find the function q. Uh, of, of course, like uh, the two points, uh, points of the solution G, Z, and X, so uh, that is to minimize the self divergence between the solutions. Uh, so, in order to do that, uh, we uh, it is very prudent to maximize the log uh, bounds. Uh, in this case, uh, this improvement minimize the self divergence. Uh, and uh, why we do that is because the variation of bounds. Uh, optimized because this term inside uh, uh, is really compute and uh, the uh, its vibration can be uh, uh, approximated by sampling the press and uh, optimizing the yeah. uh, Thank you. Uh, Shao. Okay. Um, the that you can stand in the camera. What did you do? Oh, yeah. oh, but you become a good one. Okay, so right. So in this slide, uh, we found that this this term. In this slide, we found that this term is the lower bound of our likelihood. Okay, so in the next slide, so we know that uh, we want to maximize the VLB because we want to maximize our our likelihood. That's why we maximize the VLB, which is the lower bound of our likelihood. Okay, so, so given a distribution x uh, sampled from our observed data, we want to, we want to uh, oh, yes, 
Okay. So this is the this is the VLB. Which we want to maximize. And uh QS for each data point. What happened? Uh? Okay, this just says that we want to maximize the VLB, right? Okay. Okay, so um in the next part of the of this lecture, we'll be covering this one, um learning latent covering the first point, learning latent variable generative models. And so the the next ones, yeah, the, the subsequent points are not covered in this lecture. Okay. So um, in order to optimize the VLB, which is to maximize it, we want to maximize it. The VLB is this thing, right? The VLB is this thing, I think. Can you come and help me? You know this? Okay, so, uh, so uh, the idea is that we learn an approximation of the Posterior. So the approximation is denoted as Q and the posterior is denoted as P. So this is like a specific example in which we have K latent variables. Yes, yeah, K latent variables. And then this K latent variables is uh, binary, right? So yeah, there's so. K binary variables for that. And then uh, these binary variables are, you know, uh, um, are we, uh, well, that this is just the um, it's the probability. Yeah, it's a yeah. Bernoulli distribution. Yeah. And then for x, we have l uh, binary variables for x, and uh, they have a Bernoulli distribution. Uh, so what happens is we feed z through a uh, we feed z through a, a neural network first, and then uh, after that, uh, the Bernoulli is uh, is parameterized by the x and the output of the neural network. Uh, so um, what this means is that in uh, because this is basically a simple example of when we have binary variables for z and x. So in the binary uh, setting, this means that we are taking z from our approximate uh, posterior. posterior, and then this is the VLB. All right. Oh, that's that's not the that's it's not the VLB. VLB. Oh, okay. Then it says that <laughs> it says that you can. You can find this value, right? Because, because you can get this, you can get this from here. So this one is is this term, and then, and then because you are sampling, you are sampling z from a distribution, you can also get this first term, and then this, and then this center, the second term, is your log likelihood under the approximated uh, posterior distribution. Right, because it's your, it's this, it's this thing. It's the log likelihood of this. So, so you're able to get all three terms. And yeah, yeah. Oh, this is the VLB. This is the VLB. This is the VLB for this example. Right, all the terms are the same as this. Yeah. So, so you're able to to get the VLB, and you're able to maximize it. Yeah, that's, that's it, right? Oh, oh. Uh, so, so, so. Uh, I think at this point in time, the lecturer goes into some sort of. Uh, uh, he claims that uh, these two terms is these two terms is easy, but this two this term in the center is hard, and because he phrases it as a uh, expectation maximization problem, am I right? Right. So yeah. the uh, I he wrote this. He wrote this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, he wrote, uh, I am not sure what this is. Uh, P of theta f x. Yep, so we want to optimize the expectation. But anyway, yeah, we don't have to know this, right? Because after that, he says the solution for that, he says that this thing is difficult to get. And the solution for that is the weak sleep algorithm. Yeah. Okay, so it says that, uh, so basically what we covered in the previous slide is, is summarized in this first point, is that the VLB derived from the KL divergence is hard to optimize because Z is drawn from the QX. So Z is drawn from, from this uh, distribution, which is part of the KL divergence. That's why so it's difficult to optimize. Okay, so, so the trick to do that, right, is that instead of drawing it from an unknown distribution, how about we, we come up with our own distribution, which is a beta and, and theta, and, and draw the z from those uh, distributions that we modeled by ourselves instead. So this is the idea of the wake sleep algorithm. So um, a uh, disadvantage of that is that we are drawing our the disadvantage is that our x will be from a model uh, distribution and instead of the, the observed distribution. Okay. Yeah, and, and that is why, right, even though if you maximize the VLB, you are actually maximizing the KL divergence between your model distribution and the actual distribution instead of the... Yeah, so it doesn't guarantee that uh, because you're maximizing the model, so it doesn't guarantee that the actual one will have a will have a tight bound for the block value. Uh, okay, so this uh, weak sleep algorithm happens in uh, two phases. So the first one, the weak phase, is called weak because it it explains the observed real world data. And the sleep phase is called sleep because it's uh, you're generating samples from your own model. So in the wake phase, right, you um, so uh, from what I understand, uh we know that we have this prior that we want to approximate. So uh, the wake phase does the maximization part of the, VL, of the VLB and then the sleep phase does the minimization part. Uh, so uh, the wake phase is basically we have some real world data and then we can observe it. Whereas in the sleep phase, it's the generative part. So I think in the, in the uh, language of uh, BAE, they call it recognition and generative, right? And then uh, basically the wake phase corresponds to recognition and the sleep phase corresponds to generative. Oh, yes, something to add. Yeah. Oh, no? Okay. Yeah, something to add. Okay. Huh? Yes. It looks yeah, it's the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's uh you mean this? You mean the one shown here? Yeah. The one shown here is reversed, like this two this two they swapped it. I think it's just a picture from a, a paper, so... No, 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 uh, like he said something about that. Uh, okay. P, then K, L. Let's maximize. 
Yeah, does, uh, does anyone have any insights on this? Because this one, right, it, it's Q first, then P. But for the weak sleep algorithm, it's P, then Q. So okay, so imagine you your, your P of Z given X is a it's a Gaussian mixture with two Gaussian sequences, right? so just like a half and like two times. Um, then if you feed, so that's the P of Z again. So if you feed a tube of X, sorry, Q of Z that is just a normal distribution. Uh, I remember that one of them, if you speak K of Q of P, it will give you a you will give you a Gaussian that will just sit. Because one of the both of the constituents of the two dots. Maybe I should draw it on the mm -hmm. yeah. Let me draw it on the side. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit hard. Mm -hmm. So um, what I was saying is that I remember that if you have P of uh, can I change. Yeah, so if you have that your P of Z given X is a multimodal distribution, something like that. Uh, so it's just two Gaussians. Right, um, and you let your p of, sorry, your q of z be a normal distribution, and you want to fit the parameter of q of z such that it fits. You want to fit the parameters, fit the params of q of z so that it matches this distribution. So clearly, this can't matches it, right? Because a normal distribution can't match a, mo a normal distribution only have one mode, and this has two modes. So if you fit, I believe, KL of Q to P, what it will do is it will, um, what it will do is it will fit something like that. So you'll try to match as much probabilities as possible. Whereas if you try to fit P of Q, KL P of Q, it will match something like that. Yeah. So I forget which one is which one. Um, perhaps someone can derive it ish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's different. Um. Anyone have anything to add? Or? Yeah. Do you guys think they can help us in this code search and find out? Which is the KR of QP. KR of QP is the expectations of which is Q. This one? Uh, expectation of a Q of not Q of a P, right? Yeah, which is just sort the sort the P and the Q in the. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, this this um, equation.
So, okay, so in the lecture when the when he was talking about this when he was talking about this point, so he wrote this equation. Um Z. when z is sampled from pz and x is sampled from px given z. Then minus two x equals two. We we actually say nothing. We get a space.
water lakes on the slab. Slab. So I'm looking for instances for lake C to slide that. So, uh, we will explain why this uh, KL divergence will result into different approximations. So, according to the KL divergence, uh, the, if you say the KL divergence is P over Q, then uh, we look at the discrete uh, case. It's uh, PZ, but it's lying uh, PZ over QZ. So if PZ is bigger than zero, if QZ is equal to zero, then this one will go to uh, in, in infinity. So we will try to avoid this. So we will always uh, set this approximate Z to bigger than zero. So in this case, whenever there is density in TZ, we will uh, use a density that also have density in that area to approximate this PZ. So according to this one, if you have a multi node, it will try to uh, find this a bigger one, bigger, uh, bigger uh, Gaussian to cover the whole period. But if, uh, if you use the other care divergence is Q over P, then it's like this form, QZ over PZ. So if uh, your PZ is equal to zero, you, you will never set the QZ bigger than zero. Because in this case, it, it will be also infinity. So whenever PZ is zero, you will set QZ also to zero. No. Okay. So whenever there is no density in the area, you will set the QZ also zero density in the area. So in this case, you will try to uh, use a smaller Gaussian to fit uh, this uh, multinormal Gaussian. So that you, uh, if you use a bigger Gaussian, then in here, in this place, you use this bigger Gaussian, in this place, your QZ has density, but here your PZ has no density. So it will go to infinity, and this will uh, uh, make this infinity, and this is what we try to avoid. Yeah. Let's come back to this weight sleep power. So, well, what's the intuition behind? Why are we doing this? Intuition. Uh, um, this is the this is the last slide of the wake sleep algorithm. So the idea is that we want to have our own model. To sample Z from so this is this is our own uh, model distribution. Yeah, so that's the motivation for coming up with this model. Essentially, what wake sleep is doing is that during the wake, like the wake yeah, uh, so during the wake stage, you are trying to maximize the PRP. Uh, and during the, um, actually, I think saying that's like, yeah. So in a wake stage, you are trying to maximize the PRP, which is exactly what you want to do. Right? You 
trying to maximize some P of X up um, But at the same time, if you want this bound to be as tight as possible, you want the KL divergence between your approximate distribution and the truth, uh, and the truth likelihood of Z to be as close as each other. So that's why during the sleep phase, you try to minimize the KL divergence to, to tighten the bound. Yeah, essentially, I think that's what sleep phase. But in the wake phase, it says that in the wake phase, you're using the, the, the P data, right? And, and it says that you cannot maximize the VLB because you do not know what is P data. Yeah, so you're not maximizing the VLB at the same stage. How, how about the wakes? The wakes how, in the wake phase, how do you maximize the VLB? Because you do not know P data. And that was the problem early on, right? That you do not know P data, that's why you cannot. Oh, um, so imagine that in the training, when you're training this thing, you will have a set of data, right? So essentially, okay. so that's your P data. Yeah, that's your P data because um, if you look at the next slide, you will see that the the log, marginal log likelihood, it's over, it's for the expectation over P data, right? Yeah. So anytime you see an expectation over something, you can just say that oh, I have a set of data and it's still so. So essentially, I think that's what they're doing. Set of data sets, they, they compute the, they compute the, no, actually, yeah, they just have a set of data set, and then they put the, the data into neural net to get Q of Z given 5x, and then they maximize the LB of it. Yeah. I think that's essentially what they're doing. Be covering is uh, um, problems when you actually try to apply um, uh, variational inference in a practical setting. So I think uh, the two <laughs> the two problems that uh, one of the one of the websites came up with. Uh, so I was like reading out on the various uh, uh, auto encoder. Sorry, variational auto encoders uh, tutorial is um, there's a very jargon laden concept which is uh, amortized inference. So uh, basically, now we have some uh, distribution uh, Q. Q. Uh, that uh, that that well that that is there, right? So uh, the first uh, problem with that is that um, we want to estimate a posterior distribution of latent variables. So we have some constraints, like for example, do we have lots of data? Do we have big computers or GPUs? Uh, do we have uh, local per data point latent variables? 
or global global latent variables are uh, right. So that's the thing, right? Do we want uh latent variables that is for each data point, or do we want latent variables that is shared across all data points? Right. So depending on these uh, sort of choices you can make, you can make sort of practical decision choices. And one of them is called mean field variational inf inference, which is not covered in the slides. And then oh, sorry, without the S. And then the second one is amortized inference. So in mean field, uh, what's happening is that uh, you can factorize Q uh, into a set, sorry, into N sort of separate uh, sort of separate distributions. And then now we can parameterize Q by uh, lambda, right? So lambda are like three, 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 uh, three parameters. So that's mean field. Uh, amortized inference is uh, the, intuitively we see the word amortized, we think of like, how can we share this uh, amortizing, uh, amor how do we amortize the cost of inference across data points? So one way to do this is by sharing the variational parameters across data points. So share variational parameters lambda across data points. Uh, and uh, so if we have a, uh, yeah, well, that's basically it for uh, uh, amortized inference, right? So it's uh, basically just a way to to sort of uh, make things easier to work with in real life. Okay. Uh, I'm not very sure about the Hemholtz mach machine. Uh, I'm not sure if it's important. But I guess we can move on to uh, directly optimizing VLB. And uh, the part about pathwise derivatives uh, in reading art, uh, the more common term that you see is uh, 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 the reparameterization re re trick for variational autoencoders. So if you just search reparameterization trick, you should have quite a few resources. And uh, basically, uh, the reason why it doesn't work is that uh, we need to back propagate through a random node. So over here, uh, we set Z to be continuous. I think that's the main part. Uh, so if Z is continuous now, then stochastic gradient, which means back propagation, yeah, I skipped this line, <laughs> uh, is now possible because uh, of some uh, technical conditions. Uh, so uh, basically now you are sort of like pushing the noise uh, into the node, and so the node is now uh, uh, not random. So uh, if you search reparameter, so so right, it's over here, right? Reparameterization tree. If you search Stack Overflow for it, the first thing you'll see is this kind of neat diagram where you have like uh, Z. So I'll just like try to replicate this over here on my computer X, and this is the random node, right? Because is random. Uh, so that's a problem, right? Uh, QZ given by an X. Oh. So uh, this is the problem and we solve the issue by uh, sort of pushing the noise to another um, node and uh, now instead of Z being a random node, we have Z being a uh, not random node, i.e. a deterministic node, and we sort of have the randomization occur over here. And then we can sort of parameterize this uh, epsilon term by... Uh, uh, yeah, by, just make it a standard norm. Yeah, by, by... Yeah. Yeah, and then there's some cool demos that were in the slides. So, yeah, that's it. Okay. Variational autoencoders. So, uh, an autoencoder is something I think uh, Ming Liang explained very well. So, I'll just try to do a recap. Uh, you have input, 
and you have output and we're trying we're training the model in a way that you try to match the output with the input so it auto encodes the input and the reason why we want to do that is because of this sort of uh, bottleneck over here where we try to uh, intuitively i interpret that as a compression right it is a compression algorithm where we can compress uh, x into z right so a uh, variational autoencoder is just applying variational inference on autoencoders, all right? Something along that lines. And uh, we take a look now at the loss function of the, of when you're training a VAE. So the loss function of, a, of the VAE looks like this. And it's made up of uh, two terms, right? So actually this point, this part over here on the right-hand side of the inequality is for each data point. But, well, no, actually no. Um, sorry, no, it's not, not, it's not for each data point. Uh, wait, let me think about it. Uh, okay, well, it doesn't matter, but basically this is the, 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 the loss function that we're, the, the, the objective of the training, right? Where, we have this loss function and we're trying to do it. And uh, intuitively, we can understand the two terms uh, in a certain way. So why is this called reconstruction loss? A reconstruction is a term uh, used in VAE parlance. Uh, so the, the term basically, what, sorry, trying to encourage a decoder to learn to reconstruct data. Which means that if the decoder is poor at reconstructing data, then this loss will be high. And therefore, we try to um, minimize the reconstruction loss, right? Now, we can't just do that uh, because now if we reconstruct the data, then the VA will just sort of like zoom into it, every single data point, right? So uh, the next term over here is a regularizer. So what happens is that we want to have some noise in the latent space, right? So if let's say the latent space is Z1 and Z2, we want to make sure that it's um, uh, diverse, right? So each, each re uh, representation of a data point in the latent space is diverse, right? So what this means is that uh, we want to keep representations oh God. of uh, sorry, no, keep representation Z of uh, X, where, for example, X can be an uh, MNIST digit, sufficiently diverse. Right, so this is coming from the, um, the, uh, the machine learning of terminology of VAE, right? So we have uh, reconstruction loss and regularization. Uh, and this is what uh, VAE graphically looks like. We have uh, latent space Z, and then we have uh, observation space X, and then we have uh, P of X given Z to be some normal, and then, uh, well, uh, this, is the, this is the one that we're trying to approximate. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's it really, yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, let's let's move on to some graphics to um, lighten up the mood. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who <laughs> who who um, well, I mean, I, I'm just gonna explain a bit of the the graphics over here to to see what. What's happening? So we have AEVB, which is uh, Auto Encoder Variational Best, uh, which is an improvement on the weak sleep algorithm, right? So um, uh, NS is the data set, and NZ over here is uh, the uh, dimension of latent space of uh, Z, uh, which is the number of latent variables that you have. And you, as you can see, if you increase the number of latent spaces, then um, the VAE becomes more expressive, right? Uh, as you can see. And then uh, there doesn't seem to be much difference between uh, wake sleep and uh, VAE for MNIST, but if you take a look at 
this spray face like data set uh, there's um, the BAE sort of way of doing it is much better, right? Okay, so uh, not so interesting. This is this is more interesting. So, um, can anyone tell me what's happening on the right side? Because this is literally the only part that, that I could understand. So, <laughs> so this is fun, right? Like, what's what's actually happening here? Yes, good. So the gen the basically what we have is z in two dimensions z one and z two, and let's say z is I mean z is a Gaussian right uh, so just two Gaussians and then we sample linearly and we can like as what uh, he said uh, uh, the model is now generating new samples and it's not learning it's 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 trying to have some sort of semantic meaning in, in the in the latent space and it's not sort of like memorizing the digits and stuff like that, which is the whole point of uh, latent variables. Anyone has anything to add? Okay, great. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, okay, I, I don't think he go went through this part a lot. Uh, he says that it's not good enough okay, okay. as compared to Pixel CNN. Yeah. Pixel CNN. So he says that. Uh, this one is not, not yeah. important. Okay. So, should we watch should we move on? Yeah, okay. Then this. Do you want to show the demos? Okay, then watch we do. Okay. 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 Continue. Uh, there are quite a lot of videos. I posted one on Slack uh, of the Stanford class, Stanford class of the whole semester. So it was a complimentary to all our lectures. Hopefully, you guys are all watching this too. Um, and it's good to get some kind of. I need a Mac power supply from a place. I have a USB C. Do you have one? Yeah, uh, I have this. Okay. You want to show the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that. Like, you can. So you can show the. You click on the. You can just click on the demo. And, uh, um, this one, right? No, but oh, you know, it's it's on the PDF. This is because it's on the PDF. So oh, you have to go back to the, to, the, to the Google Drive and start right here. Yeah. So you can try to do it from there. I don't know whether it will work here. Oh, this is not the right lecture notes, right? Okay, now you can see that. Oh, or I can just 
Or I can just plug in my laptop, it's okay. Pick out either one of these. Let's see which one is the one. It's one. But the video, right? You need a video. Yeah. So you need to show on that. You can, do you have the URL or something? Yeah. I can or search no, no, one. Uh, no, no, he's recording. He's recording. Hey, really? You got the URL. Um, Maybe I'll just go with it. You got it? Yeah. Slightly like No, no, you don't have to run it. You don't have to run it. Oh. The results are already there. Oh, okay. Let's go. No? 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 PD dot. Let's summarize. Okay. 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 You skip this slide just now, right? Okay, you can say how you can say this slide. Um, so the likelihood ratio estimator has like quite a few bad points. So one of the bad points is that it needs many samples of Z to form a good estimate. So if like you, you have a very low sample of Z, then the, because it must, there are two points, right? Then it is very low, then you the point will be like random places. So you cannot you cannot get an estimate. But then like for the pathwise derivative, it converges to a point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then we can talk yeah, about so so we are done with this. We can talk more about we've covered this lecture though. You still want to add something in there? I think you're right. Yeah, then we need to do the... Okay, let's start on beginning. That's the first one. No, something. Start the same. What? Sorry, three A plus three A. Three A plus three A. Three A plus three A. Okay. So um it is this part done already. Yes, this done slide thirty. Okay, slide thirty. So um, are you ready? Yeah, I guess I can try. Okay, okay so, so um <laughs> So now we'll move on to lecture 3A, uh, slide 30 of the 2C plus 3A onwards.
have time to control the sun before you talk about that. So that we can all make it a, a more visible discussion, right? Because otherwise, our production is not going to be Have you guys all been watching the right here? You guys can all contribute to the discussion. It's a, the discussion group has really a Are we all comfortable with what we're presenting today? This is more the most variable model than we want to go back to the world. Or do you want to discuss um, the variable models? Okay, five, five minutes. Uh, actually, I have a question on the page 25. Page 25? Yeah, page 25. Uh, for the uh, second, uh, second term, here, I think I remember it correctly. Uh, you mentioned that second term, AL. Uh, there's some for the purpose of the regularization, we need to be able to see uh, the representation of the disease. So, that part I don't really understand. That's smaller, but the real data is still bigger, right? For the purpose of the maximization of the nitrogen, we need to be able to yeah, maximize the clear data. I like this. Uh, like this. So, you know, regularization is just a, well, usually like a, a kind of break, right? Mm, yeah. Just a control over. So, well, I, yeah, that part is not very clear. Can you elaborate? Um, hold on, let me try to. Okay, so, um, so I'm quoting from. <laughs> A tutorial. So the KL divergence between what we are doing is we are measuring the KL divergence between the encoders distribution Q, uh, which is parameterized by phi and P. So uh, it is, as we know, it's a measure of how close Q is to P. And then uh, what happens is if the encoder um, outputs representations that are different from what, let's say we, we specify a prior, say let's say P of Z is a normal. Uh, so if we, uh, if the encounter, if, if, the, if the encoder outputs representations that are different from this over here, then it will receive a penalty. So uh, this means that uh, we keep the representations Z diverse enough so that it has some sort of distribution like this. So if we didn't uh, include the regularizer, then the encoder can cheat and give each data point a representation in a different region of the latent space. So this is bad because let's say we have uh, two MNIST images uh, of the same digit, uh, it could end up with very different representations. Say if this is the latent space Z, oh sorry, so, okay, two is a bad example. Uh, we have uh, two, two, oh God, two MNIS digits, eight and eight. So they're slightly different. Uh, but in the latent space, what might happen is uh, it could end up with a very different points. So one here, one here. So we want the space to be meaningful. <coughs> So this has the, the KL divergence term has the effect of keeping uh, similar numbers representations close together so that the representations of all digits eight are close together and all digits, for example, three are close together. Uh, and you end up with uh, this sort of neat visualization over here. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So, 
What's the difference? It's because the stars that become the robots are super maybe which will transform. So that's actually a very good but the main idea is that your standard operating system it converts the inputs to and from where the basically the standard auto encoder will might not necessarily give you continuous outputs. So let's say we take the inputs and then we put it to the encoder. The standard application is really just going to work in because it will just take whatever is given and then it will spit out something that is uh, very similar to it. So it, the output might be very distinct. But when you want to do a generative problem, you actually might want uh, to cover more in this case. Uh, I think, uh, from my understanding, uh, the major difference is that. Uh, for the normal computer, uh, 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 so basically, both VAE and normal computer uh, does uh, the compressed uh, uh, original data into some advanced uh, representation, right? Uh, but the, uh, for the VAE, uh, the hidden representation tree uh, is uh, like uh, so distribution. Uh, it's a Gaussian distribution. So it is more easier for us to sample from the so easier for us to sample in uh, from this. And uh, so you will uh, in this way you will get the effect uh, as what you show in the picture like when you change the value of this the as the generated pictures will uh, form some uh, uh, like uh, 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 uh will have some patterns of change that uh, will have some Change patterns like the, uh, the angles or the shapes, but uh, the normal only order of the I think that that's a very interesting explanation. Thank you. So the idea is that you know, like a normal only order, we are getting some base representation, but we have no way of even inspecting what that base representation is. What is that? Some model and we have to make a bunch of train models, but we don't know what those models are. So, in variation along for the we are imposing a secondary objective in, in a parameterized form 
so that we can do the calculation. Like you say, okay, now when you learn the distribution, uh, it can't be any old distribution, it's hidden from the normal distribution. And because we have this method to what that normal distribution is, in terms of a mean and variance, then it becomes easier to do the algebra. Um, When uh, we saw that graphic that they presented earlier um, between the, what was it, the, the one and the five or something, I cannot remember. Uh, you can see that um, by interpolating between those two points, you have a much smoother transition, right? What do you think it would look like if you did that type of work on the normal following closure pattern variation? Instead of seeing this thing on the right, what would it look like? First of all, could we do this type of graphic using the normal model? What at max we can do is reconstruct the inputs, but we cannot introduce variations that you want to when we are generating uh, data. And the reason, like uh, the blog post, in which they are saying that uh, uh, the main constraint of various uh, author encoders is that they can uh, successfully reconstruct the inputs. Uh, but relational, like they have posted some image in which a person, a person's image can be reconstructed such that if he's not wearing a wearing the spectacles, can like they just they are generating images that can be a spectacle. That's a huge variation. So the reason they are saying is uh, in auto encoders, the the latent space that they are generating, like while while encoding a particular input, that that encoded vector. Is in the space of discrete, like it's not a continuous space. By that they mean is that when we are sampling, like in case of variational order encoders, when they sample, the space is continuous. So when they sample from that space, a new image to generate, when they sample from that space, that space, because of being continuous, can introduce lots of variation uh, in, the, in the generated sample. Whereas it is not happening is not possible in the discrete space of the auto encoder. I think you can actually sample uh, of this. You can make a diagram like this. You can vary the parameters of the person. I believe that's correct. But you know, the images that you would get out would not be very different. But they would either look like the original image. Perhaps because the data is so sparse there, you would get a new image that you can get out. Right? So, the whole point of, uh, I think, okay, uh, that the variation of other encoders, because of the nature of the story, where you impose this extra constraint that it must fit a uniform distribution in each of the parameter vectors, it becomes very easy to have a good interpolation of that constraint. Right? And you can generate a synthetic. Uh, image in the way that's congruent with the semantics that come from uh, the compression, right? The whole point of doing the compression in the, in the auto encoder is that you want to represent that image in a smaller dimension <coughs> such that you encode all the semantics into the, into the numbers, right? So we're just trying to force those variables to have a uh, representation that's congruent with the mean and the But, uh, you know, I, again, I, I would like to ask all of you on the floor here whether there's any other intuition that you have or that you found on the web that in addition to this type of So I guess uh, 
Last time, so it came down to you. I'm not sure about things. Why I just ask out and we all have to hear the same thing because we have a discussion about it. Okay, then, then we can go back to the flow model. So, actually, I have a question. So, the question is somewhat related to Eugene's question, which was uh, because at the start of the course, we didn't really got, get to understand the sort of different models that we cover. And for someone who is a uh, beginner like me, like I would, I'd like to understand the whole like, like taxonomy, which is this slide. So, uh, I appreciate, uh, is there anyone who would like to give some input to like, um, what this whole course is doing in terms of like, the different course types of models that we're doing? Like just some explanation of like the different lectures and like what each lecture we're covering and how it all like gets together. So that I, I think it sort of helps because well I mean at least you know like which lecture is doing what. Like like we've already covered like pixel RNN and variational autoencoder, but I don't sort of understand the the taxonomy behind it. Yeah.
Uh, so this is a uh, 8A uh, slide 113. So 8A is a comparison between different uh, strengths versus weaknesses of all the things that we've covered. That's a summary of everything in one. I think last week we were covering a bit on uh, flow models and we stopped at real NDP, uh, which is this slide over here. So the next slide is on uh, how can we construct uh, flows for, um, for this sort of uh, uh, autoregressive uh, sort of flow. So I, I guess I'll start off with the um, comparisons, which is uh, the first, the slides before this talk about, it explains auto-regressive versus inverse auto-regressive flows. Uh, but uh, I guess this slide is more helpful because there's a summary, right? So, uh, um, uh, there's the, the idea is that there's a certain trade-off, which is that because certain things can be parallel, parallelized, 
uh, when you're computing or evaluating uh, certain stuff, uh, it becomes fast and then other things are slow because... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just yeah. yeah. Um, so... Yeah, okay, so um, let, let's just dive into the autoregressive flows. Uh, so, okay, so for this part, um, the assembling process of a base net is called a flow, and we can sort of uh, visualize it over here by this. So, this is a simple base net, and from this, we can sort of calculate the probabilities. Uh, this uh, the left hand side is basically the same as uh, the, when you draw out the base net. Uh, but when we want to do the, um, the mapping from Z to X, then what happens is this can be fast, but uh, this is slow. So this is uh, sampling. Am I right? Am I right? So this is sampling. And this is uh, generating inference. Inference. Okay. Maybe, uh, I think that's. Wait, this. Not very sure. The F inverse is the generation. This is inference. That, that's not. That's, that's generation. So gener generation versus inference. So uh, the deck structure causes the Jacobian to be triangular. Uh, not sure what that is. Because the dependency, right? So you don't understand what the, what is triangular. So this triangular is just uh, basically. So if you have the x and the z, it's like z one, z two, z three, right? Then x one, x two, x three. So the dependency is uh, x1 is dependent on z1 only, x2 is dependent on z2 and, and z1, this is just z1 right, so z2 and z1, and then x3 is dependent on all three, so 1, 1, 1, yeah that's why it's a triangular, so that's, that's right. So this part is fast, and uh, this part is slow, which is summarized in the next slide. Uh, and then, uh, what we can think of it is the inverse, because flows are invertible, so we can invert it. Um, so the opposite sort of holds through, right? This part is the one that can be parallelized. And this part is the slow part. Uh, yeah, that's basically it for this slide. Anything else? Anyone? Anything? Else? Anyone has anything? Why is it slow or fast? The feeling the answer is no, because I think this was one question that was raised during the video, which was if you try to combine both, then you just end up with both sides being slow. So yeah, slow and slow. So does that make sense? I think there was one of the students in the video also asked the question. The answer is well, no, no, you can't. Uh, okay, I don't know. 
important. It's like your uncle, your uncle, your uncle. Which one? Like It has any, does anyone have anything to add about these two slides? About the... Any comments about like these two slides? No, we can like move on to the next few slides. And uh, I think the glow uh, sort of thing is quite interesting. So it'd be cool if we could show like the glow thing as a link, I guess. 37. Yeah. So maybe we'll just try to like click on the link of the So this is an interactive uh, sort of uh, visualization on Glow. So I, uh, they say they use uh, invertible one by one convolutions, right? And they have a lot of training. So uh, we have some. Um, I can't really highlight here. We have some uh, uh, sort of semantic characteristics of, uh, of of this, and we can actually sort of play around with the with the knots, right? And so like, if we sort of play around, you realize that the output is actually quite um, semantically makes sense. And there's also some sort of like uh, parallel between like how happy the face is with how bright the lighting is. Maybe because like bright faces are happier and like lighting wise. Yes, no? <coughs> I mean, we can make all sorts of predictions about that, right? So, yeah, it doesn't really matter. So, that's fun to play around with. And I, I personally, I found this really interesting. Yeah. So, that's glow for you. Oh. Right, okay, so there's very little pictures or something like that. Okay. So They use a big there. So uh, 
on page seven on that, um, at the bottom, they said that they took the celebrity data set, the high quality image data set, the 30,000 images, and they use 90% uh, for training. You have, I'll say, a fair amount of data. Oops. Oops. Yes. Oh, 3,000 I read. Yeah, 3,000. That's the number of AI. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the last part we could cover is the idea of uh, dequantization, which is that if we have image data that is uh, discrete, uh, then what happens when you have uh, uh, continuous data, right? So because uh, images, the pixel value of images are discrete, then what happens is um, there's a uh, the problem arises, which is the de degeneracy. So we want uh, the integral of probability density to approximate discrete probability mass. Uh, so basically what this means is that we add noise to it, right? like uh, over here. So this is uniform noise here. So U follows uniform zero, 01. Uh, and then, uh, this solves the dequantization problem because now you have sort of uh, noise to data and this actually is very familiar because we'll use it. This sort of dequantization is also used in um, uh, variational dequantization which will be covered hopefully next week. I hope it's the same idea. I'm not very sure because both of them are dequantization. Uh, right, so this is uniform dequantization, right? We just add uniform uh, noise uniformly, and that sort of solves the problem. Yeah, yeah. So in a variational setting, we they um, there's one paper by Ho who actually does variational dequantization, which means we we instead of setting this as a uniform distribution, we learn a distribution of noise to sort of uh, solve the solve, solve this discrete problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. Why don't we just do something like this if we want to do what we are using? Why don't we go through yeah why don't we use something that we go through like we want so I can just do with that. Oh Why bother trying to explode? 
embedded in it, right? Yeah, so all of these different approaches that are trying to, uh, I guess, show that these are more general models that can be uh, all the same path. I mean, for all of these models that uh, we covered in the uh, overview slide that we narrated, they basically can uh, do similar tasks, but they're approaching it with quite different So, so perhaps it's not so good to use uh, flows for, for discrete data. But you can, this is one way that they can do it. Maybe not as That's what I take away from this. You guys have any other input on that? Actually, I was just wondering, so in this case, they use uh, x plus u. Is it because the intervals between the discrete values are 1? That's why the interval between the interval for, for u is 0, 1. So if the intervals between the discrete value are gaps of 2, do you use 0, 2 instead? I would guess so. I mean, you would so it follows the interval. Yeah. So it con sure makes it, it continuous. By the going zero, right? You want to make every point, every possible, every possible value within a continuous space be a possibility, right? Otherwise, you end up just with zero probability of this possibility. Okay, so after that, on this slide, subsequently, this is just a uh, Jensen's inequality where they moved out the law. And then, and then this part is just this part, yeah. right? Yep. So they get the upper bound of this. Which is yeah. So. After that, they have um, some directions, and then that's it for this lecture. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Okay, uh, it's just nice and they pop. Let's thank our speakers. Okay, so we had more discussion today, which is in some cases much better. But I hope uh, more people can participate. So, yeah, I hope it's uh, important that we continue to watch the video. Um, another thing that uh, I want to talk about briefly is the project. So the project is a integral part of deep learning. Um, and aside from running the toolkits that you can find in your cloud to actually do work, you should uh, think about trying to study one part of the model that you've chosen a little bit more than you could explain how it works or tinker with it under the hood. So there's a code for that, but we're not expecting you just to run the code to a data set and get results and sometimes it's really taking a long time to do that. So um, I, I want to check with you on the deadline to report the incentive here. Yeah. Thanks guys. You okay down there? Okay. Okay, so um, actually we want to go over what's going to be due. So uh, in week six, which is two weeks from now, you guys need to come up with a preliminary project title and the team members. So this course is quite unlike the other courses in NUS where you have a lecturer who knows the subject material and is presenting. So like I've already told you, this is a, 
more of an experiment where we always ask our students to try to present and for us to do all the sense making. So projects are done in the same way in the sense that uh, we want you to uh, come up with a project idea, meet other people who might want to work with you on the project uh, in class, okay? And um, come up with a, one of the deep generative models, any one of them that you think might work for that, okay? So uh, that's what you'll need to do. So uh, the preliminary project titles and team members, you can actually put not on the, the Slack projects, but you're welcome to do it there too, okay? So uh, for example, if you go to Slack, let's see, where is it? Okay, uh, and we go to the projects, okay? You can just go into this channel and then uh, just put uh, a notional idea of what you want to to work on. Yeah, so there's, and these are the old posters from the last year. But, so you can do something like this. You can say, uh, I have a particular title. These are the members of my group uh, that I would like to work with. And, and that's all we need at this point. So uh, later on, uh, we will try to flesh that out a bit more, okay? with your help, of course, because uh, the next part of it is to try to find an abstract. So at this point, after you've uh, put that information in, we would try to critique uh, whether you're going in the right direction or not, right? So uh, depending on how large your group size is, you can try more than one of the, the generative models, okay? So if you have a size uh, four group or something like that, you could decide that you want two people to work on a flow model, and two people to work on a GAN model, or two people to work on a, a v, VAE model, right? And just run it and see how, how far you get. And um, especially if you're using data sets that other people have tried or similar to what other people have tried, then uh, you will probably be a little luckier in the sense that you can draw on other people's expertise that they've written up in blogs and other places, okay? Have you guys uh, given some thoughts about which type of uh, generative model you, you're thinking of using. So we saw the slide earlier, the summary synopsis, right? We have flow models, autoregressive models, um, you know, uh, what was it? Deep stochastic networks, as well as GANs. Um, have you guys thought about what you want to do? Yes? Yes? No. Most of you haven't. Okay. So it might be good, especially if you're not in the lecturing group next week, which I think only one of us is, uh, right? So you said, you, Toshi, you said you are in the, the group uh, for week five, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know who else is assigned to your group right now, uh, whether they're here. You're, you're here. Okay. So the three of you are actually here, that's good. So um, if you're not assigned to this group of lecturers and scribes, then maybe you want to take this week to try to uh, you know, poke around in the domain area that you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in image data, maybe you're interested in uh, time series or video data, or maybe you're interested in textual data. Then try to find a, a, a generative uh, paper that you'd like to model. So you can either pick a couple different ways to do it. You can take a, a paper that is on uh, archive and then say, okay, uh, there's code for this model. I'm going to try to reproduce it first, okay? And then after I've done the reproduction of that because they have code and they have a data set, I want to uh, examine some parameters of that model to understand it better, okay? The other way you can go about doing this is to say, okay, I already have a set of data. I want to apply a couple different models on it. I pick one particular model and, and try it out, okay? Sure, you can. Yeah, you don't have to do applied. Yeah. So it, can, it depends on your group composition, what you think you'd like to do. So uh, has people thought about their group members? Because in this class, we don't have a, a particular size. It can be up to like, for example, four or five people working in a single group especially if you're a first year PhD students it's a, or undergraduate students, maybe you want to work together with people uh, in the same program as you. 
so that uh, it's easier to meet and, and come up with our, our objectives. Okay. So, okay, we'll end the class now. And so uh, for those of you who have a couple minutes, maybe you can stay back and talk with other people in the room about your project ideas. It's probably more fruitful to do it while we're all here than to try to do it through Slack when you can't even identify who the person is. Okay, so if you have, uh, you know, five to 10 minutes, maybe we can just stay here and talk about projects. Okay, but I'll, I'll stop the recording here. Okay, thanks, that's all for now.